So it's my pleasure to welcome you to another close-out meeting, a technical presentation of the NEVO project, which is Emerging Network Effects of Innovative Operational Approaches in ATM. So the basic idea of NEVO was to try new approaches to demand capacity balancing, a UDPP, based on a, a stakeholder workshop. So asking stakeholders, what do you think, how should flights be prioritized in case there are capacity shortcomings, and then to study in a in a network-wide model uh, using complex systems approaches, which emerging effects will uh, th these prioritization concepts will uh, produce. Now, actually, Isaro, who is the project, is the technical lead of uh, the NEVO project from ISTEFE, explains that much better than I do. So I, I hand it over to you. Okay. So good morning to everyone. My name is Isara Echevarria and I've been participating in NIWO project. Um, I'm going to present all the activities that we have uh, performed during uh, the uh, long uh, life cycle of the uh, project. I will uh, start reviewing the project objectives. There are two objectives and the methodology that we have followed. Then I will explain the experimental plan, which is the basis for the simulation activities. After, I will uh, uh, talk about the modeling approach, uh, which is uh, materialized in uh, ATM NEMO tool. I will also explain uh, the modeling scenarios that we have used for analysis and the, uh, some of the simulation results that we obtained. I will also present some new lines of further research that we have identified after analyzing the results of the uh, simulation and uh, after the results that we gather after the uh, project final workshop. So let's uh, start uh, reviewing the project objectives. We have two clear objectives. The first one is oriented to the exploration of the network-wide effects of the flight prioritization criteria. And the second one is more oriented to the complexity science, and it's based on exploring the innovative modeling and simulation techniques for the study of non-linearities and emergent behaviors that normally appear in the air transportation network. All the activities have been organized in six different work packages, where the first work package, the work package zero, is related to management activities. So we're going to focus on the rest of work packages. The first work package is the conceptual framework, and the objective is to define the problem statement, define the concept that we are going to use for modeling approaches, and also to define the performance targets. And the basis for NIWO is that uh, currently the uh, criterion that is, is most used uh, for priorities, prioritizing flights at airports is the first come, first serve basis. This means that uh, the delays are uh, imposed without considering the interest of air airspace users. And at the same time, this means that the, uh, the cost of the delays uh, should be improved also. So the experts uh, feels like this uh, cost of the delay could be improved. So there is a need of identifying new criteria for prioritization criteria at airports. The work package two, the objective is to identify the set of prioritization criteria that we are going to further analyze uh, through the project. The work package three is based on uh, modeling and simulation activities and results analysis, also the statistical analysis. And uh, work package four, it's uh, related to the cross fertilization between the uh, projects within work package E and outside work package E and outside CSR program with ATM community. And the work package five, conclusions and a strategy recommendation, the aim is to collect uh, all the uh, con overall project conclusions and uh, some new uh, hints or lines for further study. Most effort in the project has been focused on work package two and work package three activities. The key, the pillar for the work package two was the first project workshop and then experts from different fields of knowledge were met and we conducted two different expert group sessions. 
The objectives of these expert group sessions were to identify a preliminary set of prioritization criteria, but with out-of-the-box thinking, and also identify a preliminary set of modeling scenarios to be analyzed. After the workshop, we analyze or study the results, and finally we identify nine prioritization criteria to be studied and four modeling scenarios to be modeled for simulation activities. With these prioritization criteria and modeling scenarios, we defined the experimental plan, which was the basis for the simulation runs, and the simulation was conducted through the ATM NEMO tool, which is a macro model. The analysis of the results that we obtained from simulation were presented during the project final dissemination workshop, and then different discussions took place, and we identified a list of new lines for further research. So let's uh, see, uh, talk about the experimental plan. The effects of the uh, prioritization criteria will be analyzed, uh, were analyzed through four modeling scenarios. And uh, for each modeling scenario, there is a set of exercises to be analyzed. At the same time, to, in order to compare the results of different exercises, what we need is to calculate different values of the performance indicators to make comparisons. The next step is to try to characterize both the exercises and modeling scenarios. So we know that the network is subject to both internal and external disturbances. The internal disturbances are related to the variability associated to the air traffic processes and are inherent to the air traffic network. And the external disturbances are unexpected events that lead to abnormal conditions. We found uh, some examples of external disturbances and there are concretely four external disturbances that have been modeled by the, by the tool. So the first one is the, a storm affecting Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg. B is effects on uh, an ash cloud in Iceland. C is London Hydro security check. And uh, D is uh, French airspace controllers on strike. So these are the type of external disturbances that we'll use to model different modeling scenarios. So both internal and external disturbances are moved by ATM NEMO macro model. And uh, the internal disturbances are modeled through uh, stochastic parameters. And we'll think that if this will be the uncertainty of the system, of the network. And the external disturbances are modeled basically reducing the capacity of the airports and in a specific time frames. So this is an example of two exercises that have been evaluated. These exercises have, have been extracted from the experimental plan. And you will see that in both exercises, we are modeling current traffic situation. When I talk about current traffic, we are talking about a traffic sample that we have used for modeling activities. And it's a traffic from one day in April in 2012. Both exercises are modeled by an external disturbance, and concretely the external disturbance A. But for exercise one, the prioritization strategy that we have used is the first come, first served. And the exercise eight, the prioritization criteria that we have used is the criterion one. We'll see which is the criterion one, but this is enough to this slide. So finally, what we did is to compare the values of the performance indicators that we obtained running the first exercise and the second exercise. And these values were compared through histograms. And we also analyzed or run a statistical analysis of the results. So now I'm going to focus on the modeling approach. I will start uh, explaining and talking about the complexity science just to define uh, or contextualize and define a framework of the uh, ATM NEMO macro model. And then I will going to uh, talk about the, uh, the structure of uh, ATM NEMO. So um, there are a large number of complex systems in nature, in technology, in society, like uh, neural networks, social networks, and, uh, and World Wide Web, find a natural abstraction in the form of complex networks. So this, this means weighted complex networks. So this means that the nodes are the elements uh, that are uh, of the network, and the, weight, the weighted edge identifies the uh, interaction between, between two elements and also the uh, strength of this uh, link. So there is a whole science uh, focused on characterizing as much as possible the uh, properties of the complex systems to translate them into computational models 
to know what the uh, what the behavior of the network behavior uh, of the network, the air transportation network, and also to try to predict the response to a specific stimuli or operation. So these models uh, simulate simulate uh, simultaneous uh, uh, interactions between uh, multiple agents, trying to to identify or to predict the appearance of complex behaviors of the net, uh, complex networks. If we look at the characteristics and properties of the air transportation network, we see that the airports are nodes with symmetric relationships. And some symmetries arise when we think on some type of flights which follow a circular path. But the elements traveling between two nodes, uh, two airports, are the aircraft of the flights, and the weight of the, uh, these links is the number of uh, flights or aircrafts that, that are uh, flying from one airport to another. If we look at the air transportation network properties, we see that the air transport network presents a queue generation, a delayed propagation, congestion, and also the small world property, which is, uh, appears also in, in complex networks. And the uh, small world property means that uh, even in a very large uh, uh, networks, each of the nodes can be reached via a reduced number of intermediate nodes. And uh, the nodes are, the airports are <coughs> dynamical systems whose dynamics are, are influenced and influencing other nodes' dynamics through the uh, matrix of connections of the network. There is another property, and it's the scale-free and power-low distribution of the air transportation network. And the basis is that when we talk about the degree of a node, we are talking about the number of connections of a node, of an, an airport. If we make a comparison between the random networks and real networks, air transportation network is a real network, we see the differences represented in these two diagrams. If you look at the x-axis, you will see the node degree represented, and in the y-axis, you will see the number of nodes. So for the random networks, we see that most nodes have an average value of the degree, node degree. And for the real networks, most nodes have a few links, but there are, there are few, some nodes having, that are extremely connected. So this, this uh, uh, long tail uh, side of the uh, of the uh, this type or real networks is called a uh, power low distribution. Community structures. Air transportation network also presents community structures because the communities are the sub-networks that are within the networks and the nodes are tightly connected. And sometimes there are some nodes that are connecting different communities, different sub-networks, and these are, should be nodes that are located in the vertices of the communities and used to be hubs normally. We know that they have a structure it manifests a great tolerance to random attacks, but an extreme vulnerability to target attacks to hubs. The idea below, the modern approach followed in NEMO, is materialized in ATM NEMO macro model. The focus in, is on uh, trying to characterize as much as possible the characteristics of complex uh, networks to try to recreate the complex behavior displayed by the uh, air transportation network. The approach that we use is mesoscopic. That this means that it's in the middle between the microscopic and macroscopic level. So the, uh, the tool is considering the dynamics of every individual vehicle and in its route, but it's also considering the overall system properties as a result of integrating the different uh, states of the ATM elements. Now I'm going to present the different processes that are conducted by the tool from the beginning of the run until the end. So looking at the uh, diagram on top, we'll, you will see that uh, uh, there are four different processes that are conducted by the tool. So the first step is to identify the nodes and the structure of the network. So we have an, a traffic demand uh, as an input, and from the traffic demand we identify per each flight all the uh, airport, the departure airport and destination airport. These are the nodes uh, in our graph. And the flights departing from one airport and going to another airport, this is representing the link between two airports. So uh, this is the way that the dynamic graph is uh, generated. And uh, we also assume a free routing 
and the uh, distances are measured by, uh, in time. When we talk about the nodes and the links, uh, these, these are the real uh, values. We are representing 133 nodes, airports. They are the first uh, European airports. But the basis for this is that the nodes that are handling the 90% of the tra traffic in, the, in our traffic sample. We have another five additional uh, nodes called area, which are representing the flights that are departing from or arriving at nodes airports that are outside the ACAC area. And we have another additional node called order, which is representing the flows of the secondary airports. So now it's uh, the time to identify the, the links and we are talking about the flight links, the linked flight. So uh, we identify uh, per each flight within the traffic sample, we, we identify uh, which flights are linked and the number of links of each flight. But uh, we have also to take into account the, another thing, the existence per se of a link between two flights. The meaning is that we are facilitating the propagation of the delay. So we have th here three examples. Of, of the reasons uh, of the delays, the late arrival of an aircraft, a waiting queue from another flight, a waiting load or passenger from another flight. But for the tool, these different types of delays are modeled at the same time. So finally, what the tool uh, did is to, to update the target times. And this is an example. For example, the estimated takeoff time of an, of an aircraft of that flight would be uh, updated and will have new delayed takeoff time. And now is the time to implement the routing rules for every vehicle, for every uh, each of the aircraft. So the tool has uh, the, as an input uh, traffic demand, but a part of this traffic demand is coming from delayed flights. So it's, uh, the first point is to identify which uh, delayed flights have new links, because then if uh, there are two flights that are linked and the previous one is uh, delayed, we have here a reactionary delay. After checking the links between flights, the next step is to check the capacity at destination airport of this, each flight. If there is any capacity limitation at destination airport, then a regulation is applied. The regulations are applied at airports, so before the departure. If there is no any capacity constraint, the flights depart. And it's right here when the prioritization criteria, even first come, first serve, or any other criteria is applied. For each flight departing, we use an overload counter and it's updated. Then it's the time to represent the uncertainty which is inherent to the air transportation network. The uncertainty is introduced through the existence of internal disturbances that are primary delays. But what we do is to identify different flight phases and milestones at airports. And just in these milestones, we introduce stochastic parameters that are based on probability distributions based on primary delay data. And this is the way that we introduce these internal disturbances in the network. So now I will focus on the modeling scenarios and the simulation results. Just a quick reminder, we have uh, nine prioritization criteria with the first come first serve, which will be the basis for making comparisons for modeling scenarios, different set of exercises per each scenario and indicators per exercise to be compared. So the first scenario is called impact of prioritization criteria on the network stability. And the objective is to simulate the, all the, each of the nine prioritization criteria to analyze their effectiveness uh, in terms of network efficiency in comparison to the first come first serve basis. So uh, each exercise is a combination of a current traffic external disturbance and one of the list of the criteria that we have identified. The list of the criteria is as follows. The criterion one, priority is for flights to airports with higher, lower number of outgoing flights. This means that per each flight, we identified which is the number of outgoing flights of the departure airport. For the criterion two, the priority is for flights to more or less congested airports. So we calculate the level of congestion of each airport before the execution of the criteria. Criterion three, priority is given for have spoke and spoke airlines. In criterion four, priority is for last flight of the day, but it's the last flight of each aircraft. 
criterion five priorities for flights with more subsequent flight legs. We are talking about the flight links. We calculate the number of flight links of each flight. Criterion six priorities for flights with greater, smaller, turnaround buffer time at next airport. Per each airport, per each flight, the turnaround buffer time is calculated between the difference between some target times, between the delayed takeoff time and estimated time of arrival. Criterion seven, priority is given on random basis. Criterion eight, priority is for flights to less central destination. And here, more than centrality, we have designed a parameter which is called connectivity, and we calculate the connectivity of each airport. Criterion nine, priority is for flights connecting different communities. What we try to do here is to reflect the communities as a FAPS, the functional airspace blocks. After analyzing the different uh, the values of the performance indicators at both uh, local and global level, we see that the none of the criteria that we have analyzed uh, give us uh, showed better results uh, than uh, first come first serve shows. So I have copied some examples of the results. In this diagram, you will see the values of the performance indicator percentage of flights departing on time. You will see in x-axis one hour time intervals and in y-axis the percentage of flights departing on time. In the right side you will see that in blue the first come first serve is represented. In green and red are green the criterion one and the opposite are represented and in purple the criterion eight is represented. So you will see that for each time interval even if the difference is not quite big but the values are very for the first come first serve basis. In this diagram there are the values of another performance indicators picture. There is the average departure delay per flight. Here again the best values are the ones represented by blue color, the first come first served. In this case this is again the percentage of flights departing on time indicator but this is local indicator because we are only focused on, we can also focus on the values for the airports and this is the Amsterdam airport and we'll see also that the best results are obtained for first come first criteria. So mm, the results are that the undesirable network effects, the delay propagation, the overloads are not uh, better absorbed by the prioritization criteria that we have identified in comparison to with uh, the uh, first come first serve. But uh, however there are some slight improvements at airports so at local level. The conclusion is that uh, we need to, to analyze if, if, it's, if it's real that uh, these uh, um, criteria could improve uh, at least locally these, uh, these uh, indicators. And, uh, but this uh, will imply uh, to try to switch on and switch off the application of the criteria uh, in the network because our application is all day long. All the criteria are applied during all day long. The second model in a scenario is called relation between network stability and uh, equity. The objective is to investigate uh, how giving priority to the airline's interests uh, provide the best results in, ter in terms of network stability. And the basis of this scenario is an algorithm that uh, arose during the first project uh, workshop and uh, one of the experts uh, proposed this algorithm and uh, we have tried to, to reflect and to model somehow. So the algorithm is based on assigning priority to flights, summing up the points related to airline driving criteria and the points related to network driving criteria. So the previous step is to group the nine criteria in airline driving or network driving depending on which actor is giving benefit. Both parts of the equation are given relative weight tuning the alpha parameter. The best results in terms of global indicators at network levels were obtained when the alpha was closer to one. So this means that we are cancelling the criteria of the network side and we are giving priority for the airline interests. As a conclusion, we have to note that uh, there was no any uh, airline representant during the workshop. We need to further analyze this criteria because, because there was a lack of uh, expert users view uh, even in the workshop of the, in, during the project, uh, uh, project life cycle. So we need to further investigate if, if given priority to one airline of, uh, or a set of airlines can be good for the whole overall network uh, view. The third scenario is called airlines interest as a black box. 
We have used the same uh, scenario with the same algorithm, but in this case, as we are assuming that we don't know what the airlines, uh, what are the airlines strategies, we are uh, considering this part of the algorithm as a black box, and uh, what we uh, define is a random function to, to manage this part of the algorithm. And the results uh, were quite similar to the previous one because we had the best values were when uh, alpha was closer to one. The values of the uh, indicator show that giving less weight to network-driven prioritization criteria provide better network performance. The conclusion is that uh, even if the, uh, this uh, pattern w w was not the expected one, this is what we have found in, in, in all of our uh, exercise conducted in this uh, scenario. So we need to further analyze if we can apply some criteria at local level, locally, in a specific periods of time. The fourth scenario is called a network critical load analysis. The objective is to observe uh, the performance of some prioritization criteria. I say some because we have used only the most promising ones, the ones that we have considered most promising, under heavily congested scenarios. The basis for this congested scenario is the uh, document Challenge of Growth 2008, which uh, there it's expected that the, uh, the traffic will be double in the near future. So what we are assuming that this uh, increment uh, increase of in traffic will be gradual. So we have defined different levels of traffic. We have the current traffic, it's a traffic sample for 2012. Then we have a new uh, traffic level which is um, increased in 33%. Uh, we have another level increasing the traffic 66% and we have a double current traffic scenario. The results that we obtain tell us that in the central hours of the day the system becomes somehow unstable. It is a negative peak here. We can consider that the system becomes unstable but we also see that there is a hint of improvement in the following hours. However, it, this is not enough to, to state anything because this is a tendency of, of uh, having negative effects and we have an improvement here, but maybe we'll need to, to model a longer period of science to see if this is the real pattern or, or not. I think this diagram needs to be taken with a grain of salt because the conclusion would be if traffic goes up by 30% then only 10% of the flights would depart on time, especially at a certain time of day, and that of course is a an apocalyptic uh, conclusion. Yeah. There, there is no logic in the model that by which airlines would reschedule flights to less congested airports, and that is what you would expect to happen in reality. So in reality, if uh, you as an airline want to want another flight at a certain hour of the day, and you know that your the airport from which you would typically operate that flight is is congested, then you would um, you would reschedule that flight to another airport. So that isn't considered here, and therefore the uh, conclusions are a bit traumatic. Yeah, um, so after concluding that the first come first have prevails over, over the rest of the <coughs> prioritization criteria, uh, we decided to, to conduct a new additional literature review uh, with the aim of identifying uh, new lines of investigation with, uh, for, for flight prioritization. And what we found is the following, that one of the key enablers for CSR and next-gen capabilities is the advanced uh, onboard equipage of aircraft. This equipment will give an advantage over the known equipped ones. All this uh, assuming that uh, in an, uh, will be in an environment that uh, enhanced operations will be allowed. But the question is that how can we encourage the airlines to uh, start uh, with this type of investments and avoid uh, waiting to the network waiting system to be prepared to the situation? So there is a, a way uh, and it's based on, on trying to reward operationally the aircrafts and the airlines offering incentives uh, to early ad adapters. So, but w since we consider that uh, this uh, change from nowadays to, to a full equipped situation will take us a long time, what uh, we assume is that this implementation will be gradual. 
So there is an, one criteria which is uh, under study right now and it's called most capable best served. And the, uh, uh, this criterion uh, represents, however, the intent of optimizing the efficiency of airspace operations. We are going to distinguish uh, both parts, the most capable and the best served. So when we talk about most capable, we are considering the aircraft egg page, the crew training, the operational certification and flight planning capability. We are going to model it we are going to consider them together for this modeling activity. But for the uh, best serve, there is a challenge because they don't know how these services would be accomplished. So, uh, because it's, it would be impractical for the controllers to try to re resequence the uh, airborne aircrafts uh, regarding their equipage level. So, the solution is to establish this resequence activity of the queue uh, at airports. Because there are some airports that allow in equipped aircrafts to give them priority to no uh, equipped aircrafts that they consider that could be an acceptable metal for resequencing. There are two uh, objectives for the most capable best surf criterion approach. The first one is to assess if this prioritization criteria is better than the first come first surf. And the second one is to identify the threshold for the airlines to start experiencing benefits. What we have done is to define uh, different uh, uh, scenarios that are representing the step-by-step uh, the -step introduction of equipped flights. We have equipped aircrafts. Uh, we have defined the different percentages, 20%, 50%, and 80% of the fleet capable. Most capable best serve was modeled, and we obtained some rest simulation results. And they say that it's true that uh, some minor changes were identified within the uh, different indicators and different uh, scenarios. But when we conduct the uh, statistical analysis, we see that these differences were not statistically significant. So it's not enough for us to uh, state anything at this level. Can we say also, you say 20, 50, and 80 percent? That was only a specific airline. So the overall equipage level. The yeah. Maximum overall equipment level was only 35%. Yeah, this percentage is applied to a specific airlines, so the, prior, the flight's priority is quite reduced. So you discriminated between the legacy carriers and low-cost airlines and assumed that the, the hub and spoke airlines and like, yes, yes. can be equipped to 20, 50 and 80%. Yeah and the, the low-cost air carriers will not be equipped. The maximum overall equipment level was 35%. That's right. Normally the opposite. I think the low cost tend to be better equipped than the low cost. Yep. Oh yeah. Okay. The, the logic here was that low cost uh, operators are more cost sensitive and, and therefore they would resist more to introducing uh, expensive technology, the benefits of which weren't immediately clear. For retrofit, but they, they buy new aircraft. Mm -hmm. Their fleets are yeah. much more modern. Yeah. So things, yes, the things that are included in the equipment, the things that are in, in your list of criteria yeah. for best equipped, if you, if you wanted to show, it was. Uh, it was uh, yeah. no, 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 no. The next one? This one. Ah, okay. Yeah, aircraft, aircraft equipage. Mm -hmm. But uh, crew training, operational certification, that kind of material. Yeah, flight capability is really helpful as well. Anyway. Oh, well, we can reorient this uh, approach. Well, it's nice to know that. I think also the 35% the is probably a little on the low side, but the good thing here is the model is now there, and you can tweak the parameters a little bit. Yeah. You can run it again, and you get, uh, you get yeah. more results out of it. Yeah. That's, that's right. What we try to do after analyzing the results is to go back to the tool and try to identify the values of some internal parameters. And we realized that the percentage of the flights that have priority over the rest one with these 20%, 50%, 80% of equipage level of half the spoke uh, flights, those are reduced number of flights. So maybe such a percentage of flights uh, doesn't uh, represent an improvement at global uh, situation. If we try to give an answer to the question of how to encourage the airlines to start uh, with this uh, uh, investment, what we can 
say is that uh, giving a precedence to capable flights, which, which implies an uh, operational uh, advantage for, their, for them uh, locally, um, has not meaningful, uh, harmful effect of the global uh, network behavior. Does it make it worse? doesn't improve it, but doesn't make it any better. Yeah, no, that's uh, the, the results of the, uh, our simulation, but it is uh, um, somehow a conclusion. It's only making an exercise to find a, a reason for these uh, type of results, but that's uh, what we have found. I think there are two ways in which we could actually tweak this a little bit and, and run another simulation. The first one is the overall equipment level could be higher. There was this IGM seminar paper uh, two years or so, uh, which has been concluded that uh, equipage levels in excess of 50% only start showing uh, network-wide and all airline-wide uh, benefits. Probably we need we need to lift this up a little. Yeah. Um, which which equipage, uh, which percentage of air, air, aircraft and airlines to equip there? The, aircraft. the other thing is that the modeling approach at the moment does not give any performance benefits to more capable aircraft. Okay, so they, they, don't, they don't have shorter connection times, they, there's no uh, increased precision, there is no reduced uncertainty, the internal disturbances, the uncertainty uh, modeling here is just hmm. the same for the most capable aircraft as it is for the non-capable aircraft. And actually, that is, of course, an unrealistic assumption. You, you, should, you could tweak that as well. And, reduce the, the, the uncertainty a little bit or reduce the connection time or something like that. And, and that way you would probably come to a more realistic uh, scenario. But in the end, if you want to encourage equipment, you've got to encourage it. It's got to be a benefit, benefit for the airlines, so it's good to look at the network level. Yep. There are other benefits there, but it's, from the airline perspective, they're very selfish. They will want to see benefits for themselves. Yeah. It would be nice to see. Yeah, for sure, but uh, the key is that um, it would be nice to have uh, airlines users participating in this, uh, in this um, project or, uh, or in, um, at least in the definition of the uh, criteria and model approaches to try to, to find a more realistic way to define this type of strategies. The model is able also to produce benefits on airline basis to segment according to, uh, to airlines. So if we decide to run more yeah. uh, runs with it, that, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I will just restrict uh, the question to this uh, most, equip, uh, most capable best server. I think it's not very well defined yet as a term, as, I, as we have exchanged emails about that. Oh, okay. state. So you have put some hypothesis of what it might mean, and that is very good because at least it is a start of a discussion. But um, uh, in the most capable, it's, it's very uh, ambiguous what it means. Uh, yeah. for the airspace user, and when you only focus on equipage, then um, I agree the equipage may reduce the volume that the aircraft uh, can, uh, can use uh, and so augment the capacity. But in terms of uh, most capable, there is all the ability to be in interaction and to try to participate in, uh, in the, uh, C the wider CDM. CDM okay. And it's very difficult to to find that in the yeah. end. So I think uh, it's yeah. true to start investigating what are the different capabilities that you have in the MCBS. So you, you, when you did on what is best served, I yeah. have reservation on your solutions, but why not? But also the, the most, most capable, I think, in terms of impact on the, the right to be prioritized, etc. If it's a wider, it's a very wide issue. But it's good to think. Okay, thank you. Please to have but the most capable but best served is essentially a wider than the best equipped best served. It's because best yes. equipped is just focusing on equipment, so now yeah. we're looking at a wider yeah. exercise. Yeah. Yes. Now I'm going to present uh, some lines of further investigation that um, we have identified uh, after analyzing the simulation results and also after these uh, discussions with uh, experts uh, that attend to a final workshop of NIWO. So the first line will be to try to, to switch on and switch off the application of the criteria at network level and try to, to apply them in a specific, uh, at a specific airport. Another idea was to identify more milestones at airports and try to define, integrate and model the airport collaborative decision making concept in the model. There is another line of investigation which is related to uh, the simulation of longer periods of time 
two days of operation just to see if the network effects are softened or propagated in this absorbed, if the pattern is continuous or not. Another expert also proposed to try to analyze any other criteria, new ones, because the attendance, the, the experts that attend the final workshop and the first workshop were not the same, so we have different inputs output. We need to expand the analysis of the both second and third modeling scenarios. What we need is to identify and define more indicators of metrics that can represent the benefits of the airlines or way to calculate to value the benefits of the airlines. There was an expert that also talked about the expert user negotiation processes. He proposed uh, defining uh, new parameters for modeling expert user negotiation. There were also comments about the delays propagation. The model introduced some delays, but uh, it's done through the high density areas. But this line of investigation is uh, oriented to the possibility of absorbing the delays more than integrating the delays. Finally, what, what we uh, think is that maybe we can review to check the level of maturity of the concepts that, that are under development in CSR and try to operationally with are the concepts that, that could be uh, modeled in the tool and uh, try to prepare um, maybe a r more realistic scenarios and, and see what, what happens. So I finished um, and it's time for more questions. Thank you. I'm working in the UDPP project. So I would like to, to better understand how you, you um, when you discuss, uh, when you speak of, uh, for example, predictability, flexibility and benefits, etc., yeah. what exactly are you measuring and how did you model the airline's interest so far, knowing that probably you didn't have enough of input on that, possibly, but uh, if you could clarify this. Yeah. So you, you have two, two questions. The first one is uh, related to uh, the predictability and so on, how we model it, and how we'll, And the second one is uh, how we'll expect to introduce the airline user's views in the model. So uh, the first one is that the predictability, we use uh, predictability efficiency as a reference key performance areas. And from there, we extract the uh, performance indicators that are associated to these key performance areas. So for example, two of the performance indicators that I, I have uh, exposed. Uh, first one is related to efficiency and it, the, I think it's uh, the one related to on-time uh, flights and the uh, predictability also I think it's uh, the second one that I uh, have exposed related to the, uh, the delays, average delays I think. So the, uh, what we are, when we are talking about efficiency, predictability, and uh, capa uh, capacity, uh, cap we are talking in capacity, we are talking about uh, specific performance indicators directly related to the key performance areas. There is a set, I think that it's uh, extracted from a previous um, project, which is called episode three, and we have uh, some examples of the... Uh, of the relation between key performance areas and key performance indicators. I don't want to preempt the uh, the question and answers, but just to say that uh, I think part of uh, the interesting aspect of uh, of uh, this uh, project is uh, to uh, to start going in the direction of a, a balance or a trade-off be between what is uh, the interest of the airspace user and what is the global performance of the network. And it's, it's very good to have a tool that can support this discussion because I think it will be a big issue in the future. For example, some airspace users... In UDPP, we start from the assumption that it's not because there are priorities that uh, we will decrease the delay. It's just that the airspace user will be able to transfer the delay on certain flights because they want to protect others. Yeah. So therefore the interest for the airspace user is something different than the capacity or predictability from a network perspective. Yeah. And it, it includes some yes. nuance yeah. here that uh, could, could enrich your, your model. Yeah. So maybe not Thank to go too, too long on that topic, but I think it's important. Okay. Uh, for me it would be an important, uh, a good idea to, to continue and try to dig into this difference and the trade-off between uh, the local interest, if you want, okay. and the global interest. That's a good point. I'm working in Project 1666 and we're doing cost-benefit analysis of, sort of the, the, the CESAR developments. So when you were just talking there about the key performance indicators, for our benefits we use the B4.1 and the B5 performance assessment work, which builds on episode 3 but has different 
um, you know, the indicators are quite specifically defined. So when you're talking efficiency predictability, are you talking the same as we're talking in the, the rest of CSR yeah, with yeah. B41? I cannot give you a response with 100% of, uh, of uh, security, but uh, I don't know if we are talking about the same uh, performance indicators, but when uh, we were discussing uh, these types of things uh, during the first uh, last project workshop, uh, an expert uh, talk about the link between uh, project B4. Dot, I don't know why, and uh, yes, because maybe as I, he found it uh, some um, uh, potential uh, relationship between the model and some of the key performance uh, 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 values uh, indicators that are used. But uh, I cannot give you a response right now. The key performance indicator used were uh, percentage of aircraft departing on time. Uh, average delay of uh, mm. aircraft, average delay of delayed aircraft. And what, and what is on time? Within yeah, three minutes, was... within one minute? We don't need the specifics, it's just... Yeah, to see if we are talking about the same, uh, the, uh, the source of the uh, performance indicators, if it's the same. Yeah, it's also if you have the same name, are you measuring the same yeah. thing? It's, it was just to, to understand also because in the, the, the CBA model we have, we have the benefits and... Um, they start to come from, we've always got this question of how many flights need to be equipped to get benefits, and then for a number of equipped flights, no, a number of equipped, the equipage in the fleet, so you've equipped 10 aircraft, but how many flights do they do? So um, it's quite interesting what you're doing in terms of looking at this equipage, because we've always got this question, when do we start getting benefits, and then once we've started, how do they ramp up? So... You know, it's really interesting to know that that's sort of being looked at because that's big questions that we have. Another one, and then I'll, I'll shush. Um, in terms of the delay, we've got quite a lot of airspace users in 1666 and, and they're looking at delays and things, and they'll say that a delay will get to a certain point and then they'll just cancel a flight or then they will, or they'll bring in another aircraft so they'll, they'll change what they plan to do. Is that sort of thing? Can the model look at no. those sort of ways of... Not a change of aircraft, no, no, not yet. But it's something that we can maybe uh, further analyze in another step, but not yet. Um, there, there's another uh, project called Cassiopeia, which is also using uh, complexity science approaches, uh, and they have developed a model. Uh, which is addressing these aspects. So they have three different scenarios. They have a slot uh, swapping scenario between airlines, and they have an algorithm by which aircraft go to secondary uh, airports, by which aircraft cancel their flights, and, and so on. There'll be a final presentation, I believe, on the 15th of November. Good introduction, because POEM actually is, is quite an interesting project for this and for your follow-up project, TREE, of course, uh, because it has a very comprehensive model uh, Cassia, it's actually a common uh, team with Cassia Peel with the University of Westminster um, and uh, Andrew Cook's team there. Uh, but it's uh, passenger oriented, whereas uh, many of these projects are looking at keeping aeroplanes happy. Um, Poem is trying to say, well, what, a, you know, what about the passengers? And it's one of the first ones that, that doing a really detailed model of, of how passengers are affected by uh, uh, propagated delays and so on. One of the things I noticed actually from in your last uh, further work thing was to extend the uh, simulation over two or three days maybe. Uh, one of the big assumptions in POEM is that everything resets to zero at like midnight during the night and you start again, uh, which I think in most cases is probably true. But maybe in the case of an aircraft that that's, um, breaks down or something, there are repercussions. Uh, for, Sometimes uh, you, you can save the next day by doing something from the day. So that's so that's an interest interesting thing. Um, there's one. I had one question which was um, I, I missed I missed the the connection with at the beginning you had your scenarios your your catastrophic scenarios with air traffic controller strikes and your ash cloud and your thing, and I didn't see where that was through the uh, results you presented. It's like you presented one day's results and use the same lot all the way through or something. Yeah. I don't know. These uh, scenarios are external disturbances and are uh, represented implicitly through the performance indicators. What we do is to, uh, in the same exercise, 
with current traffic, internal disturbances, and a specific prioritization criterion, we also model this scenario external disturbance. And what we uh, try to do is to reduce the capacity of the airports that are involved uh, by the, uh, this external disturbance. We reduce the capacity in a, several, in a specific time interval. So the result is implicit of the uh, of the uh, performance indicators. Yes, what we um, I've just uh, realized that uh, at the beginning we started to yes we ran some uh, scenarios with uh, uh, this type of exercises without any prioritization criteria and focus on only the external disturbances. And what uh, we uh, also notice is that at global level the effects were not too big. The effects of these external disturbances at network level, there, there were no catastrophic. So, um, but yes, the uh, the uh, locally the airports were impacted. But at global level, it's like the uh, the model can absorb uh, these uh, these disturbances or disruptions. So even with these big catastrophic things going on, different prioritization scenarios or criteria didn't help sort the problem. Uh, not too much. No. No. So one uh, key thing is that the cri prioritization criteria are applied all day long. We have also found find uh, some uh, improvements, but uh, what we'd like to see if, if, uh, if we can switch on switch of specific criteria or even uh, combine two criteria in a specific time frame, maybe we can uh, uh, get uh, obtain better results. But this is something that it initially was uh, out of the uh, modeling approach. So you remember the bar chart that, that was here with the different uh, prioritization yeah. criteria and the evolution over the day. And in general, first come, first serve performed better than, than any other. Um, but there were specific times in the day where another criterion for an hour or two was performing better and then performed worse in the rest of the day. So it would be, you, of course, you can say, oh, I'll take, I'll take first come, first serve here and then I take the other criterion here because there's a, there's a linkage, obviously, the aircraft that get delayed in an earlier part of the day, they are still there in the later part of the day, so you can't just take slices of it. So it would be interesting to see what happens if you switch in that period where first come, first serve was not the ideal, to, to switch on another criterion there and then switch back to first come, first serve. For the whole possible. network or for certain nodes? For everything, nodes and a whole network. Because uh, the approach is mesoscopic, so we can go and see what are the values of uh, local indicators or global level. Uh, but we have found the results at uh, both. Uh you mentioned some of your results when you, you wanted to see if you focus on some sort of most capable airports as well. Ah, yeah. And I think uh, that I forgot it, it is going in that direction, so you tend to see where well, it's a mesoscopic, as you say, uh, model, that, but you tend to show that the network overall is rather stable uh, yeah. currently. But if you try to focus on certain areas where there something, l l not too locally, but I mean, you also have uh, shown that uh, the hub structure is rather solid in a way, but if something happens at the hub, if local intervention and most capable airports can help producing a new prioritization or the airspace users involved in that yeah. situation uh, propose some, some prioritization, even if there is not one single criteria but a combination, etc., how then it can improve the overall situation for the whole network? Because uh, it seems that effectively the system seems rather stable. That's good. So could you elude a little bit on, on your idea to look at most capable airports as well? Okay. That's a good point, but this will also enlarge the scope of uh, NEWO. But um, the effects of the impact on hubs, hub structures and the, uh, the propagation of the effects in the rest of the network, maybe this is, some, this is an issue that will be evaluated under three uh, work package projects, new projects which uh, have started right now. But we are still de uh, defining the conceptual framework and the uh, performance target, so we'll see, but maybe it's one of the points that we can analyze. Just a small, small comment, maybe, um, uh, Kirsten said. Kirsten was asking about the, um, how you were uh, assessing the metrics, KPAs, whatever. Actually, that's the document I said to, uh, sent a couple of days ago, which is the, so, so the next batch of projects that we're doing will use the uh, performance framework documents okay. that are being produced in, in, uh, by Cesar now, yeah. which were unavailable when we started this sort of project. So I think the document's been around 
released only uh, this year, I think. Yeah, the latest version. So they have that. So next next time you come to one for our, one of our new projects, that question okay. shouldn't we'll be, arise. Yeah. Would not arise. I mean, but it's not to be limited to that set of. No, but it gives a common vocabulary, yeah. which was one of your. Which yeah. was one of your one of the particularities of the UDPP project is that the improvement or the benefits or the impacts uh, are not fitting really the CESAR KPAs. In, in terms of targets, for the moment we have zero, 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 zero and zero. Okay, So the impact of uh, UDPP on the performance of the network are not these five KPIs chosen by CESAR. So for me, that's, uh, I'm re-saying with other words what I was saying. I think it's a good approach uh, to be able to identify other benefits than the ones and, and clearly show, I mean not uh, clearly show that there is a difference, but at least make sure that we are speaking of different things and not creating confusion because there can be improvement uh, from a business perspective for our space users, whilst for the network there is no effect at all from allowing uh, different types of prioritization and probably not global criteria. Airspace users are not looking after global criteria at the moment, so maybe we will be able to, to elicit a global, uh, a global algorithm that would mimic uh, what airspace users would do, but uh, they are more pragmatic than that. They see a situation, they try to see how to optimize their business and they propose some reorderings and that's it. And so it's really looking at the situation and try to improve. And sometimes it's only because they want to lose less money and they are not trying to help the network. Yeah. So it would be interesting to, to, to pursue uh, on that line. Thank you. Okay. A comment from my side, uh, and I'll just give you my view and see whether you agree or not in terms of uh, additional work. I mean, to paraphrase what Nevo did, uh, locked up a bunch of experts in a workshop for two days and asked them to generate uh, new approaches to capacity, demand capacity balancing and there were there were many of those and they were all tested under very specific conditions and extensive simulations and the conclusion is pretty much first come first serve beats them all so actually yes and in some cases there, there was a little benefit but uh, that was caught later on etc so I, I, for me, that is, a, that is a perfectly conclusive and fairly acceptable uh, conclusion. That first come, first serve beats all the other criteria, with the exception of uh, most capable, best served. Right? Um, so I, I'd say that is kind of a closed, for me, that is a, a kind of a closed area. You can do very specific uh, research on the specific conditions and see how switching on and switching off and all the rest. But there, there's no big... Uh, there's no big benefit to be expected, so that's a that's a good conclusion. And in mathematical, if you use stacking theory or something like that, uh, mono node then first come first serve is is the optimal solution. But we've demonstrated here that under more realistic network wide conditions, that is that is also true. Um, the other thing, however, is the most capable best served. Uh, area if, if you like and I think that is probably where more more research could be done or, or additional studies using the uh, the NEMO uh, tool and that, that would be in terms of higher equipage levels and maybe different approaches to which airline would be equipped is it more the the low-cost airlines or is it the the legacy carriers it would be segmentation of the benefits uh, according to airlines uh, to see who actually gets the benefits and it would also be uh, a per introducing a performance benefit in in the simulation to see that the most capable actually produces some some sort of capable. I mean, most capable. It means you navigate with a higher precision. Uh, your, your trajectory accuracy is better, and all the rest. And you would expect that to show in the network as well in terms of accuracy, capacity, and all the rest of it. So th for me, and that, just let me know whether you agree or not. Just on, the, on your point, I was come first. It's a mono constraint, I suppose, the, the prioritization because the nodes are airport and it's not multi constraint as it can be on the system. And the first come, first serve algorithm, yes, mono node is okay, but when you have multi node on the same flight, several constraints, you show that there are other algorithms that are better in terms of uh, yeah. reducing the delay. And so don't conclude too quickly. 
of the first come first serve as the best uh, prioritization uh, algorithm. I think from a purely mathematical point, as you say, in a mono-constrained yeah. condition, it is proven to be the optimal yes, solution, yes, but not under the real, more realistic conditions we have with very small. Where we have the same flight as several constraints on the same flight. That's right. And again, I think we are only speaking of a global network performance there. Yeah, it's the from a global the addition of delay. The addition of delays, and I think in the future. Which is only one indicator. Yeah, in the future, maybe the performance will not be delays. Maybe in the future, you would have we have customers which are the airspace users, and for them, uh, they would sometimes maybe prefer have more delay globally that is not perceivable, and but avoid uh, excessive uh, losses on their side. And I think it's a it's a next uh, era where globally all the network will have to trade off performance and not be looking only at overall delays uh, over the network. So the trade-off is important. More comments, questions? No? Okay, then we call it a day. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thanks to you.